welcome to uh, the Healthy Hearts webinar. Um, Alex, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so the webinar is going to be joint presented by myself. Um, so I'm Joe Merriman. I'm a public health senior officer within the communities team. Um, I'm going to be talking about the overview of the community health profiles um, and the information uh, regarding the healthy heart um, from the profiles. We have a uh, select 14 profiles at the moment, and uh, we've got 11 more that will be published um, within the next few months. I'll then be passing over to Dr. Melanie Martins, who will be giving an overview on cardiovascular disease, services and resources available to you. Um, you can see Mel on the camera now, if you'd like to wave Mel. Let people know you. Yeah, let you hear. Brilliant. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Just some housekeeping. Uh, please stay muted during the webinar. Um, if you do have any questions, absolutely fine. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Just pop your hand up, um, turn your camera on and, and turn off mute uh, but if you could stay muted during um, turning off any VPNs um, can help to save bandwidth um, please also use the chat function if you'd like to ask any questions um, and we will be recording this webinar as I've already said that will make sure that the link can be sent to anyone uh, who couldn't make today um, whether that's people that signed up through the event right or whether um, that's places that we can share it after the webinar uh, next slide please Alex Brilliant. Um, we will be using Menti today. Um, so for those of you who haven't used Menti before, um, it's an interactive tool that we can use um, to allow people to answer questions as we're going along. And um, it can also help us to know within the communities team um, who we've captured within this webinar. We want to make sure that we're capturing people, uh, different ethnicities, different sexual orientations and um, different religious and faith backgrounds. So we just want to make sure that um, we're collecting um, and offering this opportunity to different people. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Brilliant. Um, so the community health profiles, um, as I said, we've got 14 published profiles. Um, these profiles um, are covered in different ethnic, ethnic groups, um, such as the Bangladeshi, Indian, uh, Nigerian groups. Um, they also cover di different religion and faiths, um, people with disabilities and LGBT plus communities. Um, we've got 11 more that will be coming up, again, covering um, those four groups, as well as covering the student population as well. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. The profiles aim to find and review the physical health, mental health, lifestyle, behavioural and wider determinants of health that exist in a specific community. They're really helping to break, um, move, to move away from um, categorising people in big groups together, so they really uh, look at granular level data. Um, that being said, we don't uh, speak to anyone, um, any of the community regarding the profiles, and um, it's all from published literature, so all from key academic literature that has that um, has been available um, when we're doing the review. And the idea is to collect and present this information using themes identified from the health and wellbeing strategy for Birmingham, creating a bolder, healthier city. Um, the idea is, is that the profiles can be used as an evidence base to help inform um, policy and practice uh, within the city. Um, there's a lot of information within there and there's a lot of information that can be used um, for many different branches of um, health organisations around Birmingham. Um, we then promote these findings for local authority and wider system use. We promote them through webinars such as this and we've already um, completed a cervical cancer webinar but we also complete them. Uh, we also promote them with webinars related to the specific community. You can find all of those published on the website. Um, if I can ask somebody in the team to pop that link in, that would be brilliant. Uh, next page, please. The community health profiles do have some limitations um, of the published profiles so far um, because the 2021 census data was not available at the time. A lot of the population data used is from the 2011 census. Um, therefore, some conclusions on populations must be taken with caution. We are aiming to produce infographic supporting documents for those uh, published profiles, which cover some of the findings from the 2021 census. So they will be updated um, and we will be updating them retrospectively with those infographics pages. There are also sometimes limitations in data collection where populations may be grouped together. Um, examples of that might include within the SEEK profile uh, where ordained SEEKs and um, non-ordained Sikhs are included within uh, the, within the same group um, within a study that obviously will have some limitations in terms of different health inequalities um, that exist between those two communities 
sometimes there's also missing data sets for communities. As it's all published literature, we can only um, produce what, what is published. Um, so sometimes there are missing data sets. We can also only tell us what the data tells us. Um, sometimes the evidence out there might not tell the full picture. That's where the engagement partners come in and they help to put the evidence into action. So off the back of the community health profiles, we um, have commissioned an engagement partner for each community health profile. And they, those engagement partners are tasked to disseminate the profile amongst the community, help to fill any gaps that we might have within those communities, and also to address some of those health inequalities um, from the profiles as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just an opportunity um, to contribute to Menti. So if people can go on www.menti.com and the code is 25732059. Um, so it'd be good for us to learn um, how often the community health profiles are used in our line of work. Um, 25732059. And if I could have um, somebody in the, in the team pop that in the chat as well, that'd be brilliant. Got the little man in the corner so we can start to see people contributing as they come in. Thanks, Jordan. Won't give it too much longer. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Brilliant. And um, as I said, that we want to just make sure that we're capturing different demographies of Birmingham. So we want to make sure that um, this information is available to all communities within Birmingham. So this is why um, why we're asking people to fill this out. If you don't feel com um, comfortable answering any question, please um, do not answer or just say prefer not to say. Um, and by answering the question, you're just given consent for us to use this data for our own analysis. Next slide, please. So first one, open box, how would you define your ethnicity? We're seeing quite a few coming through. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Um, what is your age? Good. Can see people getting a bit quicker at this. Uh, great. Next slide, please, Alex. And what is your religion? Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Do you consider yourself to have a disability? I think this is one of the last couple. Uh, great, there's a come flooding through. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Um, and what is the first part of your postcode? So just make sure that we can um, that we're covering different areas of Birmingham. Um, so just the first part. Um, so for example, B twenty one. That will help us to map out where um, people are from the, in this webinar. If you're not from Birmingham, then that's fine. Um, just pop down your postcode. Um, and results are not going to be shown on the screen for this one. Um, but I can see some numbers in the corner. 
great. Um, I think people will still be able to contribute to that um, even after we've moved on to the next slide. So if you could move on, please, Alex, that'd be great. Uh, brilliant. Um, so the next section, we're going to be covering some of the findings from the community health profiles. Um, so Alex, if you could move on to the next slide, please. So to start with, with the LGBT plus community, um, you can see that lesbian women are 21% less likely to have hypertension compared to heterosexual women. And um, that was actually using a national data set from America. Um, and that we would expect to see a similar pattern um, existing within the UK as America. Um, for the trans community, um, a need for better data. Uh, data is not available on the incidence or prevalence of conditions such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Um, but one thing that we do know is that lesbian women have been found to have higher rates of obesity and central, adipos uh, central adiposity, which does increase the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So um, that's all the data could tell us for the LGBT plus communities. Next slide, please. Uh, so regarding the South Asian communities, ONS data from 2012 to 2019 shows um, rates of cardiovascular disease um, as a cause of death. Um, within Indian males and Pakistani males. Uh, you can see that rates are significantly higher with Indian males um, compared to white males with 190.9 deaths per 100,000 compared to 157.9 uh, deaths per 100,000. That's even higher for Pakistani males, 206.7 deaths per 100,000 Pakistani males. Um, Pakistani women and Indian women both have lower rates um, than Indian men and Pakistani men. 109.6 deaths per 100,000 for Pakistani women and 99.3 deaths per 100,000 for Indian women. Um, in cardiovascular disease prevalence pattern in Bangladeshi men and women follows that of the general population with an upward trend of age. Um, and within the Pakistani community, higher rates are likely determined by lower rates of physical activity compared to the general population. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with African communities, uh, cardiovascular disease is estimated that mortality due to cardiovascular disease in Kenya is 13.8%, with the leading cardiovascular de deaths being stroke, 6.1% uh, of the total population, but that is a higher percentage in females than males, uh, and, it's, and ischemic heart diseases, that's higher in males, 4.7% uh, versus 4.6% for females. The most common causes of death for the black African population in England or Wales are ischemic heart disease for men, dementia and Alzheimer's disease for women. And research from Finland has found Somali men were less likely to have more than one cardiovas cardiovascular risk factor compared with men from the general Finnish population. However, Somali women were more likely to have two or more cardiovas cardiovascular risk factors. So you can see um, some discrepancy there between Somali males and females. Um, again, we are limited uh, in the, that finding is from international data where we didn't have the national data available. Next slide please Alex. Caribbean communities, uh, you can see that ischemic heart disease is a really high cause of death in black Caribbean men. It is the second leading cause of mortality and the mortality rates for black Caribbean men and women, but the mortality rates for black Caribbean men and women are lower for ischemic heart disease than for the white group. And that is significantly so in the case of black Caribbean men compared to white men. Uh, in the 2004 health survey for England, rates of angina, heart attack, heart murmur, abnormal heart rhythm and other heart trouble were all lower than the general population for both black Caribbean men and women. However, um, black Caribbean men and women do have a higher mean systolic and diastolic blood pressure compared to the general population. So. Um, Although uh, rates of heart disease mortality are lower within Black Caribbean men and women, um, we are seeing higher rates of blood pressure within those groups. Next slide, please. For the deaf and hearing loss community, research by Emmund in 2015 found that 32% of deaf people um, reported having cardiovascular disease compared to 50% of the general population. Um, there is limited information, though, on the risks for cardiovascular disease amongst deaf people in the UK. Um, there are uh, suspected risks of untreated hypertension and raised cholesterol, abnormal lipid profiles um, cumulatively, which can result in increased risk of cardiovascular events. The rates of deaf people having um, lower cardiovascular disease compared to the general population may actually be uh, due to less screening 
as the deaf and hearing loss community might not be aware of screening opportunities compared to the general population. Um, and it says that there, the hearing status of parents and education may impact cardiovascular disease risk reduction and cardiovascular health promotion advice. You'll find that some uh, sometimes words um, don't translate very well from English into BSL. So sometimes that can be a barrier for people uh, within the deaf and hearing loss community. Next slide, please. In terms of religious communities, we also find that there's um, some gaps in data. We can uh, look at South Asian com uh, communities um, as, as proxies. We know, um, for example, that the prevalence is higher in South Asian populations with an earlier uh, disease onset for diabetes, which incre increases the risk. Um, and we do know a systematic review of 16 studies of Muslims of uh, Pakistani mm. heritage highlighted a need for both medical and emotional support for cardiovascular disease. Um, religious communities can come together and support people um, with uh, people who are struggling uh, with cardiovascular disease. And we do have a set of healthy faith settings toolkits, which are designed to help faith leaders to improve the way uh, that health topics are discussed within religious settings. Faith can be a really key um, component for community support um, for people living with cardiovascular disease but also um, for giving people um, having like people having faith as they go through a journey um, through cardiovascular disease. Next slide, please. Brilliant. Um, I'm now going to pass on to Mel, who's going to give some overview of what is cardiovascular disease and resources and support that people can have. Thanks very much, Joe, and thank you for inviting me. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Melanie Martins. I'm a GP in Birmingham and cardiovascular um, lead at the ICB with a particular kind of interest in prime prevention um, for cardiovascular disease. Um, it's really nice to see that there's a really varied audience, so um, feeding into kind of our wider community, which is brilliant. Um, so just this bit of a basic overview, really. Um, about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease or you hear it called CVD often is a general term for any condition affecting the heart or blood vessels but the things that we kind of are most commonly associated with it uh, angina or heart attacks which we call myocardial infarction so that's coronary heart disease strokes or TIAs which is transient ischemic attacks what might be called mini strokes as lay terms um, and peripheral arterial disease we mustn't forget about the legs as well our big vessels to our legs also known as peripheral vascular disease but basically anything affecting any of our um, our heart or our blood vessels around the body comes under the umbrella of cardiovascular disease it remains one of the main causes of death and disability in the UK, but actually it's largely preventable by leading a healthy lifestyle and making positive um, changes, which I know can be really, really difficult, but every little helps and, you know, prevention is always better than cure. So, you know, the, the stopping smoking, reducing weight, um, improving diet and lifestyle and more activity. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Thank you. So um, prevention is always better than cure. Um, it's really the thing, you know, we call it primary prevention before you've, you know, developed any uh, cardiovascular disease. We call it secondary prevention when you've got some established cardiovascular disease and we want to prevent it from getting worse. And we think about the ABC of heart health. So A stands for atrial fibrillation. I'm going to come on to talk about these in a little bit more detail individually. B stands for blood pressure and C stands for cholesterol. And all of these go alongside you know, dietary and lifestyle changes, um, you know, more exercise, losing weight, healthier diet, just being active, really. Um, but we, we always think of it about the ABC. Next slide, please, Alex. Thank you. So A stands for atrial fibrillation. Um, you'll commonly hear this just called AF, AF for atrial fibrillation. And AF is the most common abnormal heart rhythm. And you you get an irregular pulse when you have AF, but having an irregular pulse doesn't mean that you necessarily have atrial fibrillation. So it's really, really important to check for an irregular pulse. But as I say, if you have an irregular pulse, and lots of people are sometimes picking that up on smartwatches now that they're wearing, but having an irregular pulse doesn't mean you have atrial fibrillation, but it means you do need to exclude it. It can sometimes cause palpitations, but most often there are no symptoms at all. So lots of people, the, it increases with age and 
approximately 10% of people over the age of 80 might have atrial fibrillation. But the problem is, is that lots of people don't know that they have it because they're walking around with it with no symptoms whatsoever. So we estimate that in Birmingham and Solihull, there's probably about 25,000 people with atrial fibrillation that don't necessarily know that they've got it. The main issue for this is when you tell people that they've got an irregular heart or an abnormal heart rhythm, they think, oh, they really worry about their heart. But actually, the heart can cope really well with it as long as it's not going too fast. And actually, we can manage the heart rate normally very easily with tablets, usually tablets called beta blockers. Um, but actually, the heart can cope very well with atrial fibrillation. But the biggest problem with atrial fibrillation is it causes a five times increased risk of stroke. Our stroke risk goes up as we get older anyway, and on top of that, your increased risk will be significantly increased by having atrial fibrillation. The problem with that as well in atrial fibrillation is strokes related to AF tend to cause the most kind of devastating strokes. They tend to be quite large strokes. And the reason for that is, you know, in simple terms, we have two top chambers in our heart called our atria and two bottom chambers in our heart called our ventricles. And our ventricles are the main pump of our heart. In the atria, it does what it says on the tin. When you have atrial fibrillation, it fibrillates instead of contracts. And instead of, as it doesn't contract, it doesn't push all the blood out of it. And there's a little out pouch in the top of the, in the top chamber of the heart in the atria um, and blood can pool in that little out pouch it's a bit like having stagnant water in a pond and again your heart copes very well with that it just carries on regardless it's very resilient it's not too much of a problem but if that blood pools in that little out pouch and clots again heart's quite happy but if one of those clots breaks off it will whiz around the body and end up in the brain and they tend to be quite large clots so they cause quite devastating strokes with high you know with poor outcomes and high levels of disability in general and what we don't want people to do is realize that they got atrial fibrillation when they present in A&E with their stroke we want to find people with atrial fibrillation so we can effectively treat them because there's a really good effective treatment and that's by thinning your blood, what we call anticoagulation. We've probably all heard of warfarin, which is quite old fashioned. We still do use it in some circumstances, but nowadays and for the last decade, we've got some fantastic tablets. They're once a day, they're really easy to take once or twice a day, depending on which one, and they thin your blood appropriately to stop you developing those clots. So actually finding atrial fibrillation is really, really important because we can effectively protect people um, from and prevent strokes. So the key message here really is people need to get their pulse checked. And if you have an irregular pulse, you would then go on to have an ECG, which is very simple, can be done at the GP surgery to diagnose. AF is diagnosed on an ECG. As I say, having an irregular pulse doesn't mean that you have atrial fibrillation, but it's important if you have an irregular pulse to get it checked. So the big message out there is people need to get their pulse checked. And that can be opportunistically if they go for a blood pressure check. It can be when they go to have their flu jab. It can be by wearing their smartwatch. There's lots of different ways to do it. But if you have an irregular pulse, it needs to be checked. Next slide, please. So um, B is for blood pressure. Again, once again, there's usually no symptoms, but good blood pressure control is really important to protect your cardiovascular system. And once again, we've got lots of people out there who might have high blood pressure. They might be on some blood pressure tablets, but it's really important that we treat it to target because we really want to get people as well controlled as possible to prep to protect their cardiovascular system. It's not good enough to just kind of have it checked, start some tablets and the kind of fire and forget, as we say. We need to review it. We need to keep getting the blood pressure checked and check it remains in target. Because once again, as we get older, our blood vessels tend to get a little bit stiffer. Our blood pressure tends to go up. So the medication that's right now might not be right going forward over, over months and years. So it's really important to keep um, on top of blood pressure and having your blood pressure checked. Um, diet and lifestyle, um, weight losses and, and blood pressure medication are all really important working together to control blood pressure. I'm going to come on um, in a little bit to talk about how you can get your blood pressure checked. Um, but for now, if we can just move on to the next slide, please. Mel, we've just got a couple of questions in the chat. Is it best to answer those at the end or? Um, if that's OK, we can because I've only got yeah, a few no slides and we can come back to them. Is that OK? Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, OK, 
Um, so C is for cholesterol. Um, I'm sure um, most people have heard of cholesterol. It's a fatty substance that we call a lipid that's in the blood. Again, it's checked by a blood test and high levels increase the risk of heart attacks and strokes. And that's because you get fatty deposits which line the arteries. And as you can imagine, they line the arteries. And so the what, what started as nice smooth pipes um, are arteries. They get clogged up so the blood can't flow properly. And eventually those arteries can actually become completely blocked, um, which blocks the, the blood supply to wherever it's supplying. So if that's the heart, it causes a heart attack. If it's to the brain, it causes a stroke. If it's to the legs, you know, it can cause a, a loss of blood supply to the legs. So again, diet and lifestyle changes are really important to reduce cholesterol levels in our blood. However, and Cholesterol is in is comes from animal fats. However, you can be vegan, so you can have no animal fats in your diet whatsoever, and you can still have high cholesterol levels. And that's because some of our cholesterol is actually made in the liver. And there's a genetic component to that. So some people can have a perfect diet and lifestyle and still have high cholesterol. And that's because we can't help our, our genetics. Um, and uh, some cholesterol is also made in the liver. So lipid lowering therapy, we have lots of them, but the mainstay is statins, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, is also a really, really effective treatment for uh, lowering our cholesterol levels. So again, that's really important. Next slide, please. So I think the key message here is to, for us to kind of, you know, uh, teach people, teach our population, teach the people living in the city to know their numbers. Most people know their weight or their about, but do they know what their blood pressure is or their cholesterol is, you know, and how can we find that out? So GP is always a good way place to start. Um, healthcare assistants in GP surgeries can check your blood pressure, can check your weight, can do blood tests for your cholesterol. We have routine NHS health checks that are offered to everybody over the age of 40. Everybody over the age of 40 should be invited to those, but actually um, uptake isn't as high as we would like it to be. Attending for an NHS health check is really important. All these things will be checked, along with having um, a, a test called your HbA1c, which will screen for diabetes, and also smoking advice, dietary advice, lifestyle advice. So I'd really encourage people to attend for those NHS health checks. And um, as I say, it's available to anyone over the age of 40 at any time. If you've missed it when you're invited, you can still attend at any time. Um, and another fantastic initiative is um, there's been a launch of um, a community pharmacy blood pressure service. We've got loads of pharmacies um, in um, Birmingham Solihull who have signed up to this. So people can go to their local pharmacy for a BP check. And again, I'm going to come on to another slide to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and there's also a new project. So um, the INHIP project. So INHIP is Inequalities Programme in Healthcare. Um, and that's a project going out um, to screen for these um, ABC areas that I've just talked to you about. And we're going out into areas of high deprivation and health inequalities, you know, feeding into what Joe was talking about, the community health profiles, working with trusted groups and leaders to engage with communities and basically setting up almost like mini pop up health checks where people can have these things checked. And if there's anything abnormal, that can be communicated to the GP to then um, investigate it and manage it further. There was also um, a fantastic scheme called BP at Home, which was launched by NHS England during COVID, where lots of blood pressure machines were um, sent out to um, via the GPs and what we call PCNs, which is primary care networks, out into the community. So lots of patients now have their own blood pressure machine, which is fantastic. If patients don't have um, their own blood pressure machine, you can purchase one. You can go to your local pharmacy and purchase one. There's also a fantastic resource on the um, British Heart Foundation website about how to check your blood pressure at home um, and lots of resources. And actually, we found that people checking their blood pressure at home has been absolutely fantastic way of monitoring blood pressure and, you know, a really, really good way of engaging patients and treating them to target rather than, you know, turning up to the GP surgery every year or so. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So the Community Blood Pressure Service is a commission service. Pharmacists do need to sign up to it. Um, and um, it's commissioned to check people's blood pressure over the age of 40 if they don't have a diagnosis already of, of high blood pressure or hypertension. So anybody over the age of 40 for pharmacy signed up. I'm kind of half keeping an eye. We'll come back to the questions. But um, I think one of the questions that I saw come and go was about, do you have to pay for it? 
if a pharmacist signed up to this BP service, um, it's you don't pay for it. You turn up, you can have your blood pressure checked. So we've got a Healthy Hearts website, a B-Soul Healthy Hearts website, which again, I'll come on in the next slide to talk a little bit more about. But what we've launched on here, which I think is really, really fantastic, is um, uh, you can find your, your local community um, BP service by going onto the website. Um, you'll see this little blue icon, get your blood pressure checked today, find your nearest pharmacy, and you click on that and put in your postcode, and it will come up with all the pharmacies that have signed up in your area, so you can then go to that pharmacy. If you go to a pharmacy that isn't signed up, they, they may possibly charge you for it. I know one of our local pharmacies who isn't signed up um, charges people for, for a blood pressure check. So I would really recommend put your postcode into the postcode finder on the Healthy Hearts website. Encourage, um, you know, anyone who wants to have their blood pressure checked to do so and they'll be able to find their local pharmacy and get it done free of charge. Next slide, please. So um, we have a Birmingham Solihull Healthy Hearts website. Um, it's really, really fantastic. Um, it's really designed to support our patients and clinicians to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease in our city. It's um, a really good um, collaborative piece of work across the um, ICS footprint with the involvement of acute community primary care, local authorities, charities and third sector organisations and patients. And really what I've kind of presented today as a really brief overview, but if you go onto the Birmingham Healthy Hearts website, there's a section for atrial fibrillation, a section for blood pressure, a section for cholesterol, a section for lifestyle changes, other chronic diseases, loads of really good resources. Um, so you can click on the thing that you're interested in. For example, if you go onto the blood pressure section, it will link you to the British um, Heart Foundation and all their information uh, relating to blood pressure. So I'd really, really encourage you to um, go on to, to the website. Next slide, uh, next slide please. Um, as part of the website, we've also got a clinical resource. Um, in order to sign up for that, you need an NHS um, email address. So if you are a clinician or you have an, um, an NHS um, email address or a healthcare worker that has an NHS email address, um, you basically can go on, you send your email and they will give you a login. It's a one time login and then you can access all the resources. And this clinical resource section really is designed to support clinicians um, to better manage cardiovascular disease. Um, and we, it's all regularly updated. It's got the latest guidelines, the pathways across BSOL, the referral forms, all the training webinars, toolkits, research and evidence. Um, I think it's really user friendly and easy to navigate. So again, it's a resource that really we want people to tap into um, to help support. Next slide, please. Um, just a kind of brief word on this. This is the new um, cardiovascular prevention program that's just been launched this week. Um, so you may hear about it or you might receive some of these kind of materials um, or pharmacies. Um, we're, we're sending them out to local pharmacies and out into our community. It's an NHS England uh, funded large scale pilot, which we've been lucky enough to launch in BSO. Um, and basically they're 18 one hour sessions run over nine months, either on Zoom or groups of about 10 to 20 in person. So patients can choose which they prefer. And it's basically a programme with behavioural change programme focused on nutrition and activity. And patients can self-refer um, or they can be referred by, via their healthcare professional. So this just might be something that you hear about um, over the next kind of coming months. So just to kind of make people aware that this is something that's being launched. Um, it's a pilot, hopefully it will then um, be uh, rolled out more widely. Next slide, please. So, um, I'm happy to take any questions. I think there's a few in the chat. I suppose my question also to you guys is, is there anything else that we can do to help support? Um, and, um, but is, this is probably a good time to, for questions, Joe. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I can see um, we started off with Satish in the chat. I don't know, uh, Satish, if you wanna come on, come on camera or come off mute to ask it. If not, then um, that's fine. We can go from the chat. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the questions in the in the chat. So thank you. So um, the question is, is heart murmur and AF the same? And what is a heart murmur? So yeah, thank you very much. So they're not the same. So a heart murmur is actually 
just what we hear when we put the stethoscope on to listen to the heart sounds. Um, and it's basically a, a, a whooshing sound in the heart. And normally the heart sounds, um, you, you don't hear that sound. And a heart murmur just represents a little bit of, so there's four valves in the heart. And if the blood is flowing through, if you have a little bit of kind of valvular um, heart disease, then you can hear a whooshing sound in the heart. Um, heart murmurs are often not of any great significance or importance, but if we hear a heart murmur, we get a scan of the heart to just check how the valves are working. So it's a sign of some of the, um, of how the valves are working in the heart. Whereas atrial fibrillation is a rhythm issue in the heart where the heart doesn't um, contract regularly. So they are quite different. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Please, you. you know, do ask if you have another question. Yeah, um, so the next question, what's the safe blood pressure level? So uh, this is, a, again, a really good question. And it, there is a little bit of variation depending on age. OK, so for elderly patients um, over the age of 80, we're generally aiming for um, a blood pressure, you know, of 150, 90 or below. We have a slightly higher level. And that's because as people get a little bit older, they don't adjust their blood pressure as effectively when they stand up. They can have bigger drops when they stand up and we don't want them falling over because we're treating the blood pressure too low and then when they stand up it goes really low and they feel dizzy and fall. If you're under the age of 80, as a general rule, they say 140-90 if you're having it checked in the clinic. But actually, we know that our blood pressure is always a little bit lower at home when we're in our own environment and we're relaxed. So if you're doing home readings, our target's below 135-85. So it's not quite a kind of absolute cutoff it does depend but you know as a general rule if your blood pressure is under 140 80 as a kind of rule of thumb we're generally happy um so the next question do you have to take statins for life if you have high cholesterol also a good question so um statin we can reduce our cholesterol with diet and lifestyle and every and that's really, really important. What we don't want to do is treat everything with tablets and think, oh, well, that's fine. I don't have to do the other bit now, because actually the most important thing that we can do to help our health rather than all the tablets we can prescribe is diet and lifestyle. So, again, it will be quite individual. And if people can get their cholesterol levels really low without statins, sometimes people do choose to come off them. However, what I would say is there's definitely an added benefit of statins where if you do have any fatty deposits in the arteries, they have this added function of stabilising them. OK, so even though your cholesterol can be low, we know that firstly, the lower the better and cholesterols will lower it, um, and statins will lower it even more. And secondly, there is an additive effect of stabilising any fatty streaks in the blood. So. As a GP, I actually personally would always encourage people to take their statins, even if it's a very low dose, because there are added benefits. But like everything, it's all about kind of individual choice and, and making that decision with the patient. Um, what about over 50 um, age health check? Yeah, so, so over 40 and above, anyone can go for a health check. Yeah, so once you're over 40, you can go for an NHS health check and it doesn't matter if you've missed it in your 40s, you can have it at any age. Um, and I would really encourage people to do that. Um, so I just need to scroll down. Um, uh, can you, sorry, I think, where am I up to now? Uh, um, is the blood pressure check at pharmacies free or chargeable? I think we've um, covered that one. Can you also get high blood pressure under the age of 40? Yes, you can. OK, and that's actually, again, really important. So like all things, um, our risk will increase with age. Um, and that's why they used a cutoff of, of over 40, because our risk definitely starts to increase at that age. But you can get high blood, blood, high blood pressure under the age of 40. And actually, we would encourage people under the age of 40 to also have blood pressure checks. If your blood pressure, che if your blood pressure is normal under the age of 40, the current guidance is to check it at least every five years. OK, um, just to you know make sure. Obviously, if it's a little bit raised, we would want to check it more frequently, at least annually. And if you've got high blood pressure, more frequently than that. But yes, you can get high blood pressure under the age of 40. That can be related to 
genes. Some people have high blood pressure in their family. And if you have high blood pressure in your family, I would definitely recommend getting a blood pressure check under the age of 40. But also diet and lifestyle. If you're overweight or obese, you're much, much more likely to have high blood pressure. And I would definitely encourage at any age checking your blood pressure and knowing your numbers. Does that bring us to the end of the questions, Joe? Uh, there's still a couple more. Um, Alex, could you move on to the next slide, though? Because I'm aware that we've got a mentee up available for people. Um, so, yeah, the same again. Um, there's a question from Karen. Um, how do we how do individuals self refer to the cardiovascular disease prevention program? Yeah, thank you. So um, what we can do is it's, it's literally just launched this week. We can send out a link if you like. Maybe if I send that to you, Joe, I, we can send out a link. Um, and then there's certain in, uh, just to really, really briefly, I won't go through all the inclusion and exclusion criteria, but they do have to have um, a diagnosis of high blood pressure um, and they mustn't have established cardiovascular disease. So it's a prevention program. But if you like, I can send you that information, Joe, and maybe we can send out the link um, in the meantime all the materials will be sent out more widely to all GP practices um, and pharmacies um, that are involved with the blood pressure check. So it will be kind of out in the community, but I'll send a link if anyone's interested. Yeah, brilliant. That would be great. Um, Javid's asked a question um, it relates to the deaf and hearing loss um, profile, really, in terms of we, we're really starting to see that in action, um, a, a difficulty in accessing services um, for people with hearing impairment, um, I w I'm wondering whether we can connect in with bid services who are our um, deaf and hearing loss engagement partner. They might be able to support people in um, booking a GP appointment um, for people who have difficulty booking appointments over the phone. I know each GP practice is uh, different and please tell me um, if not Mel, but I know some um, are a little bit more set up for booking online and some are a little bit more set up for telephone appointments and it depends on the availability of the GP practice but I think bid services would be able to help out um, and help to give support. Yeah thanks the only other thing I'd add to that Joe is um, because of Covid all GP practices were set up with something called Acurix where we can um, do it by text message and actually we found that that's been been really helpful um so like you say it will depend on the individual practice but that's been a really something that's been really helpful that we've used as well to help support this group of patients yeah brilliant um alex could you move on to the mentee so people can answer um i know there's another couple of questions and um, satish what does heartbeat indicate like and watches 50 to 80 that's just how many times our heart is beating uh within a minute um Javid, is under active thyroids and high cholesterol levels linked? Um, and you can see on the mentee, uh, what barriers do you face in relation to heart health? Um, so that's one that people can be doing in the background as well. Um, some of the questions are being answered. Um, so, um, so having abnormal thyroid function definitely can increase your cholesterol. And what we would normally do is correct the thyroid function and then recheck the cholesterol levels. Um, and then take it from there. But having abnormal, if your thyroid function is very abnormal, it will skew your results. So you can't, you then have to correct it and recheck. Re um, so just to answer that one, um, is diabetes and high blood pressure a high risk of stroke? Yes, um, is the bottom line. All cardiovascular risk factors, they're all additive. So we have lots of different risk factors, but um, diabetes will increase your risk and high blood pressure will also increase your risk as well. Thank you. Um, so question, um, answers just coming through on the mentee. What barriers do you face in relation to heart health, um, work stress and workload? Um, so really important, as Mel has already said, make sure um, that people are being physically active, but also make sure that people are taking time to unwind um, to help manage stress levels. Uh, make sure people are getting adequate sleep as well um, is an important one. And healthy eating lifestyles, um, as Mel's already covered as well, um, a lot of dietary changes can help. Uh, people with their heart health and um, enjoying rich foods too much so that goes into the unhealthy eating lifestyles um, accessing a GP can be difficult and referral to cardio team delayed and um, so having to wait a very long time despite concerns flagged Mel is there anything from a practical experience that we can do to help overcome that 
Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I totally understand everybody's frustration. It is really difficult and um, it, it is frustrating. There are there are long waits. Um, it can be difficult to, um, to access the GP. What I would say, though, is one, again, one thing that has really, really improved is the wider health team. So, you know, we've got lots of other people working with us now, paramedics, um, community pharmacists. Um, you know, all sorts of other people in the team. And actually, a lot of them, you know, advanced nurse practitioners, a lot of them are really, really experienced as well. So sometimes you don't, always, it's not necessarily just the GP um, that can help support you with that. So, um, but, but I do understand people's frustration. Um, the other thing I'd just like to say as well is that um, activity, I'm a, you know, walking is brilliant. You know, I think sometimes people feel that they have to go to the gym or do really high intense, you know, high intensity exercise, but actually walking is absolutely fantastic. So sometimes the simple things, you know, I, I know it takes time and effort, you know, getting off one bus stop, you know, sooner and walking one, you know, simple things like that that you can build into your day. Um, it doesn't have to be kind of, you know, signing up to a gym, you know, building a walk into your day is absolutely a, a brilliant way. That's activity and exercise. Yeah, and I and I think just to follow on with that as well, Mel, is just making sure that people use the resources that are available at that early stage in um, prevention as well. So if that's having a blood pressure monitor at home, if that's going to your local pharmacy and having your blood pressure checked. So taking steps um, both from a point of view of, as you say, physical activity and healthy diet, but also making sure that you're getting your heart checked um, as early as possible as well so that um, we can go on more of a prevention pathway rather than a treatment or cure. Um, brilliant. Next slide, please, Alex. Um, and another open one, how can we support the community with heart health? Um, Mel's really kindly shared some um, the resource to the VSOL Healthy Hearts website. So hopefully some really good resources there that people can have. Um, the webinar um, hopefully can be helpful as well and the link to the recording um, can be shared with everyone. So. Hopefully um, the people that have attended today learn some really useful information um, and hopefully that can be shared around as well. Um, more engagement and so that kind of supports what I was just saying. Um, but yeah, if there's anything else as well that we can do uh, to support the community with heart health, I think it's really important as well. Some of the community advocates um, that we've talked about, um, making sure that people are listening to people that they respect and people that they trust as well um, within the community. Um, Bernie's just asked if there's anything that you feel um, that is missing from the website, please let us know. Um, Mel or Bernie, I'm just thinking, is it worthwhile sharing the BSO email in in the end of um, presentation um, resource um, that I send through so that people, if they look through the website over the next few days, think that there's anything missing that they can let you let you both know and see if I'm up. Brilliant. Thanks, Bernie. Um, Chris Baggett has just said, um, so this is more for people um, for Birmingham City Council, but people who work uh, for the council at Woodcock Street can use the free blood pressure machine that's near the old pause cafe on the ground floor. So that's really useful. Uh, thanks, Chris. Community talk being visible in places of worship and supermarkets and so places that people frequent. Making contact with hard to reach and forgotten communities. I think that's where the community advocates come in and putting it in places where people often go to. Um, more information for public to see and read. Um, so sharing that Be Soul Healthy Hearts website as much as possible. Advertising local hospitals um, and stands with literature um, and supporting with exercise and diet. Some, so, some really helpful um, things for us to consider. Uh, next slide, please. Alex. What other methods could we use to spread awareness within communities that we don't engage with as frequently? Um, so we've discussed some of those, um, whether that's your local pharmacy, whether that's webinars like we have today um, or any of the community advocates and community champions. But if there's any other methods that we need to consider, then that would be really helpful to come through as well. that now we've answered everything spread awareness perfect 
Um, can I just um, just because it kind of links in here, Joe? So this mm. um, NHIP project, um, what what um, Bernie's kind of on the call in the background, she's um, leading on this, and it's a fantastic project where actually we've identified the PCNs, the primary care networks, the two most deprived PCNs in our city, um, and that's exactly what somebody uh, mentioned on the previous slide about going into you know being visible supermarkets, leisure centres. Um, um, places of worship and actually part of that project is where we're going to those communities where we've identified um, a kind of hard to reach communities and exactly that rather than healthcare settings which might feel like a barrier to people we're going into supermarkets places of worship leisure centers um, where people can have their mini health check where they can have their abc checked basically so we're going to do um, a pulse check we're going to check their blood pressure um, and a little finger prick point of care testing for their cholesterol. If it's normal, fantastic. People can take that away and know their numbers. Uh, if it's abnormal, they can take that into their GP and say this has been detected and, and take it from there. So I think that's a really good way of going out. I think it's really, really important that we work with our community to reach these hard to reach communities because there certainly are some people that, you know, coming to a healthcare setting just isn't as accessible or comfortable for them. And Mel, um, when those places are out, whether they're places of worship, leisure centres, etc, how can people find out where to go for um, for these checks? So I think I can see Bernie on muting, because oh, <laughs> probably better to answer this question. I'm coming in now. Don't Thank worry. you, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> so we worked with the community. I'm just going to just build on a point that Mel made. We talk about seldom heard communities and hard to reach communities, but it's very often that the services are hard to reach for those communities rather than the other way around. So what we've done is working with communities that already exist in um, in the core 20 plus five, so the areas of high deprivation and increased CVD risk. Um, and we're training those community advocates to actually carry out this uh, CVD um, high risk conditions, um, the ABCs within those actual communities where people go. They're also doing a lot of pop ups. So what we'll do is as we've got lots of comms and it's very early stages at the moment, but we'll have a lot of comms and that we can share that so that people we can get that message out while um, we're also working with um, BBSC so that they can help us in terms of making sure that everybody knows when we've got these pop up um, clinics and we're having some summer events so that people can um, join us that as well rather than those groups that already exist so that people that are passing are made aware of it as well so hopefully we'll get a lot of a lot of input from those um, people in communities that we don't often see in general practice that's brilliant bernie and the communities team in public health will help share information um, the boulder healthier champions will as well and we'll work on getting it set up with the neighborhood network schemes as well um, Fantastic. So Thank we, you. we can support with that from the council. Um, I've seen somebody there on the comment that said have helped community champions for each area. The neighbourhood network schemes will be able to support with that. Um, and as you say, in the key priority areas where we do need to increase um, those health checks and um, preventative and treatment for cardiovascular disease. Um, a few good ideas coming through. Uh, know your numbers campaign. Um, community community radio or presenting through schools and college and colleges to pass messages to families um, having open chat rooms and forums and um, joint social media campaigns with community organization and faith groups um, there's a note there about pharmacists being a good resource but cuts are being imposed um, that's where the inhip project will be brilliant um, it's allowing the checks to be done in in different places um, and whatsapp groups and making sure that every contact um, with health services count um, really important one as well to make sure that people are having positive experiences when they're getting into healthcare. Um, I think that's the end of the questions, Alex. Can you just check 